We ranked their strides themselves, but let's take a look how they fared against their 2019 counterpart. Hey Grafadas, last time we discussed the Premium Collection 2020, we ranked all the strides from winners to losers and have a better understanding which are actually the good strides that came out of this set. But there is something interesting that we can analyze and it's something interesting to discover once we take these strides and lay them side by side by their 2019 counterpart as we can see either an evolution of the clan itself or a very interesting dynamic and even maybe a new underlying strategy that Bushrod is trying to establish for the respective clan in their premium landscape. So without any further ado, this is probably going to be a long video. So let's jump straight into the clans and the strides themselves. And we're going to do them in the exact same order as we did for the winners and losers video for the premium collection 2020. So we're going to start off with Royal Paladin. And Royal Paladin got two very interesting strides the past two years as they got Divine Knight of Twin absolution saint of twin sword for the 2019 premium collection and for 2020 they got holy dragon crystal luster dragon and what's interesting about this stride is that saints of twin sword was a really good multi-attack potential card as it allows you to fetch out any grade twos it allows you to get power on these units so if you did this mid to late game you could have a very deadly multi-attack potential going on and this card was scaling through the entire match as it became stronger and stronger the longer the game progresses so it was a good early game stride as well as a good mid late game stride but then we get to the new stride and this card is basically the perfect and the embodiment of standard plus royal paladin but not only that this card also combines really well with old school strategies like the Alfred engine with the blaster engine as well as some of the legion archetypes and all that good stuff that we have in the OG era of Vanguard but what's interesting about these cards is that once you put them side by side you see something very interesting here as the old stride is a very good first stride but also a very solid late game stride but the same can be said for Crystal Lost Dragon thanks to GB3 ability with the garter stick on top of it. So either of these cards could be a good first stride and they can be followed up by the other to have a finishing play if one of the other is a better fit for your deck. Especially with all the multi-tech potential and the new grid tools coming around in standard which will empower Saints of Twin Sword. So if I would give these cards a rating I would say that Twin Sword is a solid 7 out of 10 and Crystal Lost Dragon is somewhat in the same capacity of a 7 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10. But once you combine these two together, I think there are a solid 8 out of 10 stride combination for Royal Paladin. As you now have a very solid option for a first stride as well as a second stride. And both of these strides synergize really well with the entire package of Royal Paladin. Even with both of them being able to flip any stride unit. So they can flip up the Gancelot stride to give all your Blaster Blades to resist. If you need that in specific matchups. Then the next clan is Oracle Think Tank. And for Oracle Think Tank they got the new Ichikishima Esteemed Deity of Abundant Water. Ichikishima in 2019 and for 2020 they're going to get Sterling Witch Momo. So Ichikishima was definitely a 10 out of 10 card because this thing was insane. It blocks any type of defensive option because it nullifies all other abilities and could swing in for some high, high numbers. So this was a deadly first try and for obvious reason was banned. So it was a 10-10 but now it's basically unrated. Because the card doesn't exist. And when we take a look at Sterling Witch Momo. This is basically the perfect card to fill the gap. Which the new Itsukishima left behind once it got banned. Because Oracle Think Tank was lacking a solid aggressive early game stride. A good first stride option. And Sterling Witch Momo is basically that. But this time in a more fair package. But it also synergized with the whole concept of Oracle Think Tank with the whole top deck manipulation, the whole trigger stacking and all those kinds of crazy interactions that Oracle Think Tank is known for. So Sterling Witch Momo is for me a pretty solid 9 out of 10 stride as this is a really strong stride and probably will help make Oracle Think Tank a lot more competitively on the premium landscape as long as certain things don't go wild in the format. And from Oracle Think Tank we dive into Angel Feathers. And Angel Feathers is one of those few clans that got shafted the last couple of years with the premium collection sets. As in 2019 they got Evangel Seraph of Raphael Mitra. And this year they're going to get Holy Seraph of Basaciel. And both these strides are exactly not what Angel Feather needed. 
Both of them are stall cards. Raphael Mitra heals you excessive amount of damage, but doesn't really do anything besides that. And Holy Sheriff Bassaciel extends your damage zone, but besides the late game guard restrict, also doesn't really do anything. So Angel Feathers is still left to be a somewhat of a stall deck, but a really weak kind of stall deck because healing damage is probably the weakest form of stall because that also leads to deck out issues and because deck out is a serious problem then what's the point of this type of stalling you probably are better off with stalling if you have increased shield value as we're going to see with other clans that actually do this a lot better so Raphael Mitra was basically a 2 out of 10 stride and Holy Seraph Basaciel is probably also a 2 out of 10 stride and together they honestly are a 1 out of 10 because they basically do the same thing and they don't help the clan at all so this is a really really bad package for angel feathers the next up we've got shadow paladin and shadow paladin got some really interesting strides it's, last year they got drag principal morfessa and this year they're going to get dark dragon chain ranker dragon and let me tell you, Morfessa, definitely 9 out of 10 stride. This is a really, really powerful stride. The only issue that it has is that it needs some setup, but the setup cost is no issue for Shadow Paladin at all, and it can really do this very fast and probably on the first stride turn. So Morfessa is a really good card, and the power potential of the card is insane. But then we get to Dark Dragon, Chain Ranker Dragon, and this is basically the ca carbon copy version of Crystal Lost Dragon. But... I'm not so sure if it's in the same ballpark as the Royal Paladin duo because those two cards can be played in the same exact deck as they are both combo potential with the same engine and can be swapped out by one another in the same exact deck. This is not the case for these two strides as the Morfessa deck is very heavily focused on a ritual focused deck and the Dark Dragon Chain Ranker Dragon is mainly for a standard plus build and maybe some OG options but definitely not with Luart or with Ritual so where Morfessa is 9 out of 10 card and Dark Dragon Chain Ring and Dragon is probably around the 7 out of 10 in the same ballpark as the Royal Paladin Stride but combined I probably think they're more around the 6 out of 10 because they are nice for the clan as a whole but they do not help the clan to unify their strength and become even stronger out of this collective set. Then from Shadows we go to Golds and Golds got Golden Dragon Spare Cross Dragon last year which was a really strong stride which obviously is a 9 out of 10 card. The thing was insane, it boosted Golds to an insane level especially with the whole Ezel engine and still without the Ezel engine will be really strong as you can just superior stride on your opponent even if they aren't on grade 3 which is pretty insane if you think about it but now they also got golden dragon blampen dragon which is in my opinion a solid 7 out of 10 stride because it does what the other strides do in certain circumstances but it also has some differences and niches that it allows it to be unique and probably playable in different builds because you can actually combine these strides really nicely as you can go into spare cross dragon as a first stride if you want to superior stride on your opponent and then next turn you can go into golden dragon blampen dragon to just utilize the extra on calling but also not minus on hand so you actually sustain your hand size while also applying pressure and you can combine it with all types of multi-tech cards from the standard era instead of the old Jira. so you have more flexibility here so i honestly think that together there are a solid 8 out of 10 package because they do strengthen with each other and that's why it's definitely better than just Blamp and Dragon on its own. Now we get to the last clan for the United Sanctuary and we have once again a clan that in some regards got shafted both years as Genesis got Complete Beauty, Amaruda and Frost last year and this year they get Hero Deity of Zenith Marduk and I've seen many, many comments about both cards from players that they say, oh, there is in this particular situation, this card is good, or this particular situation is good, or in standard plus is good. But there are so many flaws or so many hoops and hurdles both these strides need to jump through that I do not see that it's worth it. The whole superior stride thing of Morduk is really obnoxious and probably doesn't give you a lot of value even in the standard plus build and even with Valkyrian. Because... The playing Valkyrian in premium is really inconsistent. You need to get that. You need you need to understand that because you're running a lot of janky cards and you're betting on so many things to go right to get this thing off. And that's not what you want to do in pre uh, premium. You want to play something as consistent as possible. Otherwise, you probably will be outplayed on any big tournament. And 
Amfru Amruda Amphros was basically a lot of skills, a lot of options, but nothing actually sticked. So where Amruda Amphros is probably somewhere around the 4 out of 10 card, because there are so many niches, I would give the same for Marduk, also 4 out of 10, it's not the absolute worst cards because it is useful in very specific niche situations and somebody might figure something out with the deck but i don't do not believe that any of these cards are actually meta relevant then from the united sanctuary we dive into the dragon empire and dragon empire got very interesting strides as last year they got flare general dumbjet Valor, and this year they're going to get su supremely heavily emperor dragon zombus dragon and what's interesting is that Dungeon Veiler is definitely an 8 out of 10 strat. This thing is insane. The restand potential, also the, that it interacts with Sentinels and G-Guards, is pretty good. The only problem is, is that this card needs Blaze, and against certain decks it might be really hard to get this thing off. And also, if you do it early on, you cannot put pre PGs in the drop zone, the power level might not be all that great. But, interesting enough, its weakness is covered by Zembus Dragon, because Zembus Dragon can just field nuke the board for absolutely free, for nothing, and that is basically really good in the scenario where you cannot go into Dumbjet Veiler. So where Dumbjet Veiler is a 8 out of 10 card, I think Zembus Dragon is probably a 5 out of 10 card, the only, and the reason for that is, yes it field nukes, but it doesn't really do anything besides that. So, can you afford that in premium, a turn just to wipe the board? Not so sure, but if you put these two cards together, then I think they're actually a very solid 7 out of 10 combo duo for the clan as a whole, because now you have definitely a stride for every situation, and you might get more value out of every single turn. Then from Kagura, we dive into Nubatama, and Nubatama is an interesting one, because last year they got Emma Stealth King Mujin Lord Daigoku, and this year they get Rikido Demonic Dragon Yakumeso. And Yakumeso is, in my opinion, definitely in around the 8, 8.5, 9 out of 10 card, because it's really insane, gets a lot of value, and can even be utilized with the Jamiya Kongo engine and all that kind of stuff. But then we get Daigoku, and Daigoku was seen as a 4 out of 10, maybe 5 out of 10 stride at best, because a lot of the strides in the Premium Collection 2019 didn't really allow you to do much, as most of the skills that could be utilized with Daigoku don't really work, and probably most players will not allow you to use the skill. But... With all the new strides within this new Premium Collection set, Daigoku got a significant buff, as a lot of these strides actually are prime target for Daigoku. And as soon as more and more clans get these strides that they actually want to use, means that Mujin Lord Daigoku is getting a lot better. So I think this is turning into a 6 out of 10, 7 out of 10 card that you probably want to run a couple of copies of or maybe at least one copy for in a scenario where your opponent gives you the perfect situation where you can just win the entire game by just dominating their stride which they blatantly just left open so interesting enough these cards are actually pretty good together because you can use Jakumeso for the aggressive place of your deck and Daigoku cannot just be that Sneaky option that might win you the game out of nowhere. And because Jakumeso works in a dominate deck as it can substitute the Rinna card with the whole Jamiya Kongo engine, it actually works pretty well together. So from Nubatama, we dive into Tachikaze, and Tachikaze got some really solid stride. As last year, they got Unrivaled Ruler Gluttony Nero Boros, and this year, they're gonna get Destruction Tyrant Gontoraptor. And Nero Boros, in my opinion, was a solid 8 out of 10 stride. It was a new restander that like the old uh, dogma or the new gluttony stride archetype allowed you to reset without losing drive checks this was the exact same thing only now it interacts with the equip gauges as well and it could generate equip gauges but then this year we're basically going to get an anger blader stride version and this in my opinion is somewhere in a ballpark of a 7 out of 10 stride because yes it's an anger blader it's a little bit different because it could also retire on attack with the restanding and stuff but because it's just an Anger Blade in the Stride version, makes it a lot weaker because Anger Blade was as strong because in standard you could do that while your opponent was still great too. You cannot do that with this version. So that makes the card a lot weaker. But if you combine these cards together, these are actually really good strides just like the Royal Paladin duo because you can go into the Gunter Raptor, set up your board, multi deck a couple of times, create multiple gauges, and then the next turn you can go into a Nerberus and then go wham without actually sacrificing units 
And because Gunter Raptor flips a unit face up, you can flip up a Gluttony in Air Burst, which then allows you to use its G-Zone ability in the turn you stride into a Nair Beerus, which makes all your effects even more deadlier, which allow, which is pretty damn solid. So where one is an 8 out of 10 and one is a 7 out of 10, I think combined they are a solid 9 out of 10 duo, because you're starting to fill in all the different gaps for Tachikaze, which, which they had, and now they start to look like a beast of an engine that could kill any opponent in any type of situation. And I think this could be the final push they needed to make actual consistent top tier status which Tachikaze had a top tier stance but it was on and off in certain situations not everybody was taking them seriously and I honestly always saw their potential but probably with these two strides together might be enough for the public eye to actually notice them for once. Then from Tachikaze we go to Murakumo and if you thought the new stride Dianoia from Murakumo was already deadly enough it becomes even deadlier when we take a look at this previous stride from last year. Because last year they got Ambush Demon Stealth Dragon Shibaraku Victor. And this card was a unique card as it allows you to copy cards from the drop zone. Which was something that fixed it an issue for Murakuma. Because Murakuma copied units on the field. But if your field was retired you couldn't actually plus this anymore. And with this you had always a situation where you actually could plus or get some cards into the board, which was a major issue for Murakuma at the time. But also its second ability was interesting as it allows you to have a Shadow Stitch ability on a strike unit, which allows you to give more attacks. But in most situations you couldn't really utilize it. So Shibaraki Victor was probably more on a ballpark of a 5 out of 10 strides, which was more of a niche card and actually made a big impact on the meta landscape for Murakumo. But now that we've got Ambush, Demon Stealth Dragon, New Dio, which is a 10 out of 10 stride in my opinion, because that, that thing is insane. It's insanely strong, it's probably really consistent, definitely with the whole standard plus build. But there is one important thing here. This card, multi tags because it resends the entire board and all that kind of stuff. And you're probably always gonna take the Vanguard attack, because it comes with a gigantic Battle Door effect. But on attack, you flip something face up. Which means you can flip up Shibaraki Victor and then have another potential attack ready. Because you're attacking with so many attacks, it probably forces your opponent to guard one of these attacks. And if they did not guard before you attack with the Vanguard, so they so they need to guard one of the attacks after everything resent, that means you get one extra attack out of thanks to your Shibaraki Victor in G-Zone, which then can activate its Shadow Stitch ability. So just by resolving New Dio, which already gives you inherently more attacks and more insane value, you get one more extra attack off thanks to Shibaraki Victor's G-Zone ability. And this makes New Adayo even more deadlier. And what's even more insane is if you combine this with the whole uh, Cray Elemental engine that can flip off even more units in the G-Zone, you could potentially flip up more Shibaraki Victors beforehand and then set even more deadlier combos off before you do all your thing. You could definitely set up a OTK turn when you go into New Adayo and you have a couple of soul left. Because this is pretty deadly. So where one is a 5 out of 10 stride and one is a 10, 10, 10 out of 10 stride. I think combined they are a 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 because they're really deadly together. Now with Nubatama out of the way we go to the last Dragon Empire clan and that is Narukami. My precious Narukami. And last year they got Conquering Supreme Dragon Conquest Full Great. This card was an absolute 1 out of 10 stride. It did absolutely fuck all it didn't work for the clan there was no scenario where it actually was useful because in the early game it wasn't good enough and in the late game we got better stride that did what it wanted to do but a lot better but this time this year we got conquering supreme dragon stun first dragon and this is around a 9 out of 10 stride this is an insanely good first stride as well as a late game stride as it rips out your opponent's field to stretch. It rips out the drop zone if they rely on a drop zone. It rips your hand to stretch while also applying a lot of pressure and combining with your standards v series support, which is insane. And the ironic thing is here is that this card replaces Conquest full grade in all capacity. It's a much better first stride and then it's a much better late game stride. But also once we go into the late game, 
we got s cards like our GB8 or uh, our, our Voltage, which are much better than Conquest Full Great. So yeah, together, these cards don't mix. They they really do not align together where Conquest Full Great will probably never ever see the, the light of day and Stunverse Dragon will probably be at least one or two copies in every single Narukami deck because it's that good and it's pretty damn cheap. Now from the Dragon Empire done, we go into the Stargate and we start off with Nova Grappler and Nova Grappler last year got a pretty sick stride which is Universe Ace Buster. And this thing was a beast as it could restand a lot of a lot of the time it had a lot of drive checks and could accelerate the G zone which was pretty good with especially the GR support with the latest Victor boost that it got before the GR ended. But this time they're going to get Hatromorphic Dragon King as a bulk and these two strides could not be much more apart from each other than anything else because a universe ace buster was mainly focused around itself it looked at this rearguard to empower itself but it was mainly the Vanguard that pressured. And with Azda Bulk, the pressure comes from the rearguards as you spread it out with the multi tech of resending your units. The interesting thing is that Ace Buster is probably around a 7 out of 10 stride. It's not insanely strong as a lot of people, as myself included, thought it was, especially since you need to build around this car to make it work. And even then, it's pretty RNG reliant as you rely on your trigger sacking to win the game. Uh, but Azda Bulk is just. Kind of whatever with just the restand. There isn't a lot of gimmicky things or things you could abuse with the stride. It just does what it does and that's about it. So that stride is probably around a 5 out of 10, a 4 out of 10. But interesting enough, because you do have these two strides, you could both splash them together. And if you could not use an Universe Ace Bustard, you might have more value out of an Asda Bulk as you at least know the amount of extra attacks you're going to get. You at least know what minimum value you're going to generate. And if you could not utilize a Bustard, you probably could not really utilize a winning champ as well as you need somewhat of the same pieces to make both strides work. So I think even though Asda Bulk isn't a great stride, it might help you to set up or at least make some plays where other Nova Grapper strides couldn't really utilize that particular situation. Then the next line we're going to tackle is Dimension Police. And this is an interesting one as last year they got Strongest Command Chief Final Dimax DX or D Cross. And this stride was pretty interesting. It had a really interesting mechanic and an effect. But the card itself wasn't really that great and made it a 5 out of 10 card stride because you were really reliant on the cards that you got and you never had a guaranteed value or the amount of attacks or pressure, pressure that you could generate with it. So that was the main issue of Final Dimax D Cross. But then this year they're going to get Heatwave Beast Gale Maglas and this is a really interesting card because it ramps up the pressure of DP as you could multi tag but the, interesting, the most interesting aspect is that it increases the defensive capability of the clan, which is interesting, especially if you combine with the latest support that also increased defense and their previous VR that was Dyliner that also increases the defense options of your great free. So this could be a new direction for Dimension Police where they start to be very defensive and then in a late late game start to swing with insane amount of pressure and attacks because also your grid freeze are getting an insane amount of power boost. Then the last clan for the Stargate Nation is Link Joker and Link Joker got two very solid strides. They got last year they got Death Star Vader Global Avalanche which was the evolution of the global stride which incorporated the new bind mechanic of the V-Era standard Link Joker, which is really interesting. And it also allows you to lock cards, but even get more power because it counted for the amount of locks as well as binded card in a bind zone, which made it a more aggressive card than the previous Avalanche that only looked at a maximum of five cards that were locked and that's about it. This card didn't have that capacity on the amount of power you could generate to all your units. So this was, in my opinion, a solid 7 out of 10 stride as it could also circumvent anti-lock cards as you just bind them and your opponent is just gonna minus out of nowhere. But then this year, we're going to get Nebula Dragon Variant Dragon, which is an anti-standard card as it eliminates markers. And interesting tidbit, this does counter the new 7Cs engine as that's also markers. So yeah, 7Cs doesn't want to face up against this clan in a premium format because oh boy 
But the, this card, in my opinion, is a solid 6 out of 10 strides, 7 out of 10 strides, mainly 6 out of 10. Because it counterplays certain strategies and with more and more standard plus on the horizon, this card could become better and better and better because you get a lot of value. And together, I think they're a solid 7 out of 10 duo because the Global Avalanche does support the standard playstyle, but also supports the premium playstyle with the locking and has some outs against anti-lock strategy, so you are more flexible. And with the new marker destruction strike, you even have an out or a counterplay against marker-specific decks. So now you have all kinds of options, all kinds of anti-plays, and you could really, really annoy the hell out of your opponent, which is a pretty good combination for Link Joker, because Link Joker is probably one of the most annoying clans out there, so if they make their strides pretty annoying, then they're doing a fine ass job. Now with Stargate out of the way, let's go into the Dark Zone and we start off with Spike Brothers and Spike Brothers last year got Shoot Down Sovereign Violence Ace. And Violent Ace was a unique card that allows you to draw an excessive amount of cards if you have a lot of cards in your G-Zone face up, which is pretty usual for a Spike Brothers deck if they go in the GB8 route, which may gave them another option beside the whole Hell Heart 8 play. But it also allows you to keep chaining your multi tags as every time your opponent guarded or put multiple guards onto the Guardian Circle, you could then call another unit to the Rigor Circle, which fueled your multi tag. And I think on average it was a 6 out of 10 card. It wasn't the best stride, but it gave Spike Brother players another option or another out in certain situations where maybe the Hellward A play wasn't as optimal because maybe their whole hand was shredded to nothingness and a low hand size means your Hellward A play is probably really really weak but then on the other hand we've got great hidden villain verminos and verminos is somewhat similar to violent ace as it could chain with a lot of multi tags but the only difference is that this interacted with your force markers and where violent ace was all around counter blast this is focused around soul blast so this basically gives you a different way of doing the same thing and only the, only the difference is this card draws and then calls and Violent Ace can draw a bunch of cards beforehand and then start minusing for multi tag So there are different approaches here depending on how many you could draw. You could maybe plus or minus that turn. So that's to be looked at during your place. And I think they are somewhat in the same value. I think they're both are around six, to 10, 6 out of 10 strides. But I think there is some value with them both in the same deck. And the reason I say that is because they do exactly the same thing, or at least similar enough, but because well, one is focused around Counter Blast and one is focused around Soul Blast, this means no matter the situation you find yourself in, you could set up a loop, no matter if you have an excess amount of Counter Blast or an excess amount of Soul Blast, or I should reverse the hand gesture because of the stride. But Regardless, this gives these strides more potential. And I might be wrong here because I'm no Spike Brothers expert, but I think this is an interesting dynamic between the two strides and maybe should be looked into for potential future plays or future deck building as this could be a different approach than the whole Hellheart A play that is really looking around your hand size, which might not be the most optimal play, especially with something like the Narukami Strides in the format. Then from Spike Brothers, we go into Dark Regulars, and Dark Regulars got, again, a very interesting direction, because usually the the power lay or the rating goes up in this direction. The last year was weaker than the previous year. That's most in most of these strides the case. There are some strides the reverse, but not as gigantic as this one. Because Dark Regulars last year got Evil Ghost, Pontiff, Gustiel, Daimonas. And Daimonas is an insane 10 out of 10 strat in my opinion. Because it copies two abilities of two cards. Which can be anything. So it also is somewhat of a standard plus build. With the whole B Brufus and NLK shenanigans that's been dominating premium. But also the fact that it powers up with all the soul charging makes all your attacks insanely powerful, which is a very, very, very deadly combination. So this is a solid 10 out of 10 strike. But then this year, they're getting Uphill Chief Galvant, which is a RNG soul charge engine that doesn't give you any value on a consistent basis you might draw some cards you might get a high guard restrict on one single attack or you might get 50 50 on both fields and it costs you a counter blast 
yeah, this ain't it, chief. So I think this is a 2 out of 10 stride, which probably has a very, very small window of opportunity of usefulness to it. And I think definitely everything hinges on Gastil Diaminas. But even together, I think it lowers Diaminas' ability because Upheaval Chief Galvant Soul Charge randomly, which could accidentally Soul Charge your targets that you wanted to use for Gastil Diaminas. Which then shuts off Gastille Dominos for your entire game. So yeah, I think together they're probably a 4 out of 10. Maybe even lower. Because I do not recommend playing these two cards in the same build. Especially if you're planning on striding into Upheaval Chief Galvant on a consistent basis before you go into your Gastille Dominos. So yeah. Heat my warning on that one. Then next up we've got Pill Moon. And Pill Moon last year got a solid 8 out of 10 strat. Which was Fencing Begatrick Dark Lord Princess. This was a really good strat. It gave you a free restander. It gives you even some GB, GB acceleration. It gives you multi attacking Which was pretty good. Because it doesn't cost you any counter blast. Which made it very versatile. The only issue was it relies on Magia. Which made it... Only useful with the Harry GB3 stride or the Harry promo, which is the reason why it's an 8 out of 10 and not something like a 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 because it was limited. But this year they're going to get mid ear Mega Trick Yvette. And Yvette is another Magia stride which works with Dark Lord Princess. And Yvette in itself is, in my opinion, already an 8 out of 10 stride. This is an insanely cheap because, once again, it doesn't cost you countless, it's just a flip. And it could give you an Exo Circle, and if you went for Exo 2, is an actual plus, and you could multi attack with it. And so both of them are 8 out of 10 strides, but because this one is a Magia, and this one requires a Magia, they are definitely a 9 out of 10 combination duo for me. Because, yes, they have the Harry promo stride, but then again, Yvette is not a Harry, and Yvette doesn't cost you counterless. So this whole combo, where you attack twice, where you could multi-attack and do all kinds of shenanigans, costs you zero counterblast. That's insane if you think about it. Then from Pill Moon, we go into my boy, Gear Chronicle, and Gear Chronicle got two very, very interesting strides. Last year, we got the Timely Revival in the likes of Interdimensional Dragon, History Build Dragon, and I'm gonna be very honest with you guys, this is a... 7 out of 10 stride. It's pretty good for the Time Leap Engine, but it wasn't good enough to revive the whole Time Leap Engine on its own. It still needed something like a Chrono Jet Dragon with the whole Force Marker and then applying some other cards that relied on the Chrono Jet Dragon Hard Card or a Vanguard name. Now with the standard Chrono Jet e coming out very, very soon, this problem will be fixed for the Time Leap Engine and makes it definitely a lot, lot, lot stronger. But on its own, it's still 7 out of 10 stride. But... This could all change. This card could still have some more useful value with this right. Interdimensional Dragon, Grog Grog Dragon that we're going to get in Premium Collection 2020. Because this thing is definitely a 9 out of 10 strike. I wanted to give a 10 out of 10, but everybody will probably be... Ah, fuck it, I'm giving the 10 out of 10. This is a 10 out of 10 strike because... It will help Gear Chronicle 2 in main levels. We can do all kinds of crazy, crazy plays. But what's interesting enough, this thing interacts really well with the Tiny Leap Engine. As you could combine this with History Build Dragon as well. As depending on the scenario, you can either strike into this thing first. Or you can go into History Build Dragon for a turn. Set up your plays. Flip another History Build. Give your Tiny Leap units extra power. And then you go into a Krog Rock Dragon turn. Which then also empower everything because you have the History Build Dragon uh, face up and then with the whole restanding options and potentially your Uratars and your drones that will then time leap or you bind them with your Krog Rock Dragon and you go off you can do all kinds of shenanigan plays but also another interesting thing is that History Build Dragon could somewhat compete or, or at least could somewhat be combined with the Cray Elemental Engine or at least the uh, order card that you can then fa flip it face up in the early game so it can give your time leap units extra power and actually utilize your time leap combos in the early game. So there, so in that aspect could revive History Build Dragon's uh, value. So I think where History Build Dragon is a 7 out of 10 and Croc Rock Dragon is a 10 out of 10, definitely 10 out of 10, I think combined, I think could be a solid 8 out of 10 because there are scenarios where they could be very useful together, but there is probably more, they're probably highly likely more on the separate build 
but I see potential of them being utilized in the same similar build with some really interesting tech options like within the whole uh, Tempest Sphere order card and that kind of shenanigan place. But we still need to experiment a bit more before we can conclude on that part. Then from the Dark Zone we go into Megalanica with Grand Blue. And Grand Blue got last year Ghosty Great Emperor Big Obadiah. And this was a solid 8 out of 10 card. Because this card could sell up your drop zone the fastest unlike any other card in Grand Blue. And this could facilitate a second turn Megiddo OTK turn without any problem as it could fetch any key pieces as you could mill all your skull dragons and be ready for next turn and all those kinds of crazy plays and the extra power is pretty nice and also that you can swallow on the board allows you to apply some pressure in the early game as well or should i say mid mid game but then this year they're going to get white legion sailing ship bad bounty and this is also a solid 8 out of 10 cards because this is a restander in a in a clan that isn't applying pressure with their vanguard everything was rearguard centric so if you're up against a deck that could control your rearguards you really didn't do as much but with this strike you could fix that problem big time and i think together they're actually a solid 9 out of 10 combination the reason why i want to say that is because big obadiah with the whole megiddo uh, otk is already a solidified deck which is pretty damn strong if he, it even made finals in the premium uh, world championship this year and for obvious reasons as you should never underestimate that deck but it did have some glaring weaknesses against certain matchup but those matchups are now suddenly playable and winnable thanks to bad bounty so i think these two cards together are definitely better than them on a separate basis so yeah definitely a combination as a nine out of ten absolutely and then after grand blue we've got bermuda triangle and bermuda triangle is another one of those yikes clans because last year they got dearly desired grand stage shandy and this card yeah this card was it, it, it was just not it this was a quite a mediocre stride and it still is i think it had some place but definitely was not good enough this is a 2 out of two out of 10, maybe 3 out of 10 stride, that's about it. And then this year, when we thought we're actually going to get a solid stride, they they went, they went, they just went full, full retard because they decided to release Valuable Verve Vederica. And this stride is even worse, in my opinion, than Shandy. Because Shandy can be splashed in all kinds of builds. It doesn't even have to be in Harmony build. And could, some, could fix up some issues while you were playing. Vederica, on the other hand doesn't fix you issues it basically creates issues because you actually need to build a unplayable highlander build in premium which is super inconsistent in a format which is mainly dominated by consistency so yeah this is a definitely a one out of ten stride for me and together they're a one out of ten because i don't even see how these cards should work together uh, well on the other side there is because Federica asks you to call mermaids and Shandy is a mermaid, so that's how you could use it. But besides that, it's it's laughable. I really feel with Bermuda Triangle players because they really got shafted just like Angel Feathers the last two years. Although Bermuda Triangle cannot really complain as they got really solid standard support that could be used in premium. Yeah, you know what? Bermuda Triangle players, they cannot complain. Angel Feathers, they, they are deserving to complain. Now with Bermuda Triangle out of the way, we go to Aquaforce, and Aquaforce last year got Torrent of Determination Valios Revive. And this was an interesting stride, as it allows you to basically apply pressure while not be as concerned about key pieces because you could draw cards back. But the also the interesting part is if you had enough cards face up in your G-Zone, you could set your opponent's base power to 11, which was like the old Valios stride uh, skill, which was interesting. And within Premium... That's pretty good because everybody has a 12 to 13k base. So this allows you to force them even lower. Which even with the new blue wave support works. Because that is different than their original base power. So this could not work with the new stuff. So that might make this card even better. The only problem was is this wasn't a good first try. As you were still relying semi on key pieces to make the thing work. So on average I think it's a 7 out of 10. Because it has some plays. But it lacked the correct support. But I think that is now fixed with the new stride, Blue Storm Steel Dragon, Jumble Dragon. As this card doesn't really care about 
any of your key pieces. It just is flooding the board, it's applying pressure, it retires stuff, and it resets stuff. That's really solid. And what's pretty good is because it flips. So you have a lot of options and you could set up for Valios Revived next turn. Or you could go in Alexandros, but depending on what type of build you could play, Valios Revived could be a very solid finisher after you went into a Jumble Dragon. And because you only need two G units face up and Valios Revived also flips the G unit face up, you could go into a Jumble Dragon that then flips a Galifa or Galphilia, which then can be flipped back for a counter charge, so actually you could change the Jumble Dragon skill into a Soul Blast. Which is actually pretty insane to think about. So, yeah, I think Valios has a lot of potential. And Jumble Dragon is definitely a 9 out of 10. And with Valios being a 6 out of 10, I think combined are good, are good for 8 out of 10. Because these cards definitely empower each other and opens up options and could go into one another. But definitely Jumble Dragon has more options as it could also set up for things like Alexandros, Megiddo, or whatever. So that's why Jumble Dragon is definitely above the combination between these two. But definitely Jumble Dragon improves on Valios Revive. Definitely. Now with Magalania done, we go into the last nation, which is the Zoo Nation. And we start off with Mega Conley. And Mega Conley last year got Guilty Empress Dark Face Gridora. And this was hyped up to be an insane stride as it could counterplay any type of main strategy at the time. As it could just lock anything out. Uh, didn't allow you to superior call, even with G Guardians and that kind of stuff. And force your opponent to always rewrite. But in practice... This wasn't all too great as, yes, you could stall at the game, but your opponent could also basically survive as you didn't really put out a pressure. And once you start to run out of your options, your opponent will probably just kill you in the long run. So you couldn't really capitalize on everything. So this was probably around a 7 out of 10 stride. It could definitely shut down certain decks and instantly win against certain decks, but wasn't strong enough to be a meta contender or meta viable option. But this could change... With the new stride that we're going to get in the new set, as we're going to get Pillaging Mutant DT Deprano. And Deprano, in my honest opinion, is probably around a 3 out of 10 stride, because in this current environment, is not good enough or not strong enough to last in a fast, aggressive format that we have in Premium right now. But the interesting thing is, this is too slow and could not survive in a fast format, so you could not utilize its full capacity. Gridor, on the other hand, slows down the game enough, but you could not capitalize on the whole thing because you didn't kill your opponent and they will eventually just outright kill you as you don't get enough advantage. These two cards match really good together as Gridor could allow you to stall, stall, stall for multiple turns and if you could manage to survive that long, you could then go into the Prano, eliminate their last options and then outright kill them because they couldn't do anything anymore. These two cards could really work well together. And so I think the Ghidorah is a 7 out of 10. The Prano is a 3 out of 10. I think the Gather could be a solid 6 out of 10. But this need to be experimented a little bit more. Because on paper they work well together. But we have to see in practice if this actually will work. Obviously in the, in the current environment that's going to happen in Premium. It will not work. But then again, nothing that I, ex that I talked about or discussed today will work in the current environment. There is a potential if they allow to play this game out in the way that it should be played out. And then I think it's very interesting to look at these two cards together as there is definitely a potential between them. Then, then from Mega Conley, we go into Great Nature and Great Nature last year got Apex Science Dragon Monomagur Aurum. And Monomagur Aurum is a different card that utilized the new engine for Great Nature, which was interesting, but also could potentially multi-tech more with its G-Zone ability, but wasn't really all that much utilized in most cases as it wasn't really that strong enough. And Typically a bit too slow, but it was definitely a very solid option with the whole extra power and potential drive checks. So I think it was a solid 7 out of 10 stride. It was pretty good, but not as oppressive as you would expect from most other strides. But then this year they're going to get Omni Science Dragon Chippa Chikam. And Chippa Chikam is a very unique stride. It's very, very specific 
and has also a very small window of opportunity, but it allows Great Nature to go to their GB3, or most notably known for as ZOA, on a more consistent basis. And for that, I think it's a 3 out of 10 stride, because it probably is very, very limited in its potential and in use. But, with that said, these two cards together are very interesting. Uh, because Manamaga Armor has the Jizun Soul Blast ability that if your Vanguard attacks, you could Soul Blast and call a card from your hand. And then Chibichikami's ability, whenever your rear guard attacks, Soul Blast and turn a Jizun card face up, and that unit gets plus 5k power, yada yada, for the amount of cards face up. So basically, every time a rear guard attacks, Chibichikam will flip up a Jizun card, which will probably be in Manamaga Armor, and then um, you do that a couple of times, and once the Vanguard attacks, you can activate all those Monomagarmor skills and then recall even more Yunsan to the board. The only problem with this interaction between these two cards is that it will cost a insane amount of soul. Because you probably need around 8 soul. 4 souls to flip up all the Monomagarmors face up and then another 4 souls to activate all those Monomagarmors. You don't have to, but that's the maximum potential for this combo. But this could be an interesting interaction between these two strides, which could make them better together than they were separate. Now with great, great Nature out of the way, we get to the last clan, which is Neo Nectar. And Neo Nectar, last year, got Untainted Holy Damsel Green Katrina. And Untainted, I'm not so sure if that's if that title still stands, because it's it was a 10 out of 10 card, and it definitely got tainted, and so much tainted to a degree that Bushrod had to ban the card outright, and yeah, just like Ichikishima, you might have get the 10 out of 10 rating, but unlike my boy, Gear Chronicle, you just got yeeted out of the game, and basically makes this whole discussion invalid, or unuseful, or basically uh, unrelevant, because this year, they're going to get Entracing Flower Princess Sandrine, which in my opinion is probably around a 5 out of 10 stride. It has some options. I talked about this in a previous Losers and Winners video about the premium collection. But there's nothing to compare here with this card with Katrina. If Katrina existed, this combination would probably be a 1 out of 10 because you never use this card and you only go for Katrina. Because there was no reason to go for this stride at all because Katrina existed. So yeah, for Sadrine, it was definitely the better outcome that Katrina got banned, but for Neo Nectar as a whole, the clan definitely got stepped back a couple of steps and they now need to start to rebuild their potential meta relevancy without Green Katrina. But luckily for them, a certain blue ball with a stormy friend might save the clan and destroy the format. Hashtag Zazen to Zero. With that covered, we basically talked about all the clans, and this was an insane long video. Uh, hopefully, can edit it down to definitely one under an hour because we're already way past the hour mark. But there are a lot of interesting things to talk about when you look at these two strides from last year and this year as. When you look at them on a separate basis, which I did in both losers and winners video, and I definitely encourage you to watch that video. But if you go over the losers and winners video for 2019, go watch the updated version that I did two months ago, links on top, because it gives you a better insight of what the actual standings are after a year of development with more and more support. It's interesting to look at these cards on a separate basis, because you can just look at their power potential within the clan as a whole and general. But if you look at these two strides, specifically these two strides, what they bring to the table and how they could interact with each other, you start to see uh, interesting links and options that might not be as obvious if you just look at the strides on an individual level. And that can definitely be the case for multiple cards. And this is the reason why I definitely encourage everybody to look at cards not only in a vacuum. A vacuum can only give you as much value. You start, need to start looking at multiple cards and see what the links are. And also look at the patterns that Bush Road lays out in their sets because they definitely have a certain direction that they want to go with specific clans in what type of playstyle they want to push the clan. As some people might think they're just putting out random cards, but Bujo definitely has a roadmap for these clans and what type of playstyle they want to emphasize on how they want to play the deck. It was especially seen during the late year when they started to push ZTB for Gear Chronicle big, big time as they want to push the clan away from Time Leap. And in the beginning stages, it wasn't all that successful, 
but definitely in the later stages they started to figure out how to do it and if you want to learn more about that story then check out this rise and fall video where i talked about the history of gear chronicle from the beginning of the year when the clan was introduced all the way up to standard before they got the new wave support for chrono fang and chrono jet pretty interesting watch got a lot of positive feedback on this video and if you haven't watched the video then i definitely recommend you to watch the video as this as it's a really good watch but with that said, that's basically everything for this video. Let me know in the comments down below what you guys thought of this video. It was definitely a long one, but there's a lot of interesting things to talk about. And with 24 clans and basically 48 cards to talk about, you tend to have a long video on our end. So let me know all your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. And maybe I'll overlook something about your specific clan, as I'm definitely not an expert on every single clan, as there are 24 clans, and that's way too much for just one single person. As always, this video has been brought to you by our lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash so Fangit Insider. You guys are amazing. If you do want to support the channel or everything that's happening on the channel, then you can simply do that by subscribing and hitting the bell button to be updated for future video, as well as liking the video and and if you want to support us a bit more directly, you can simply do that by going to patreon.com slash Insider and become a patron today. But nowadays, you can also go to my Twitch, which is twitch.tv slash MrTimeLeap and be a follower when I go live stream all kinds of Vanguard Zero content and maybe non-Vanguard Zero games, but for now, mainly going to be Vanguard Zero. And you can also check me out on Twitter, which is Twitter slash MrTimeLeap for all the latest scoops and insight on whatever is happening on the channel and everything regarding what I might do on the internet basis, because that's the social media that I'm updating the most. But with that said, I'm Mr. Time Leap, and I'll see you guys in the next one!